Thank you all for coming out again on the first Saturday program. I think we got a really interesting one today. Again, hopefully, um, it's the Native Americans in the uh, in the the Cape, <coughs> Jersey Cape. Uh, we have Melissa Palmer from Middle Atlantic uh, Center for Arts and Humanity here with us today. Melissa also does a program down at the library. In case any of you are interested, this is a plug. She does it on creative writing. You do have to register if you do want to get to it. But uh, So she does that here, and she's going to be doing this today for the Middle Atlantic Center. So anyway, let's give an applause for uh, Melissa Palmer. historically. Um, in order to give you our background on our visitors who came to the Jersey Cape, I have to tell you a little bit about the Lene Lenape themselves. Lene Lenape means original people. Now these people were here 10,000 years before anybody else was here. I'm talking going way back to the world of Pangaea. These were literally the first men and women. These were the people who walked over the Bering Strait and these people settled this whole coast. Um, these are our visitors who would walk down to the Jersey Shore on vacation, much like our visitors that we get every summer. They would walk down here when the weather was warm, and the fishing was good, and the weather was great, and they liked to spend their time here. It was a very, very different culture than that of the English settlers or the Dutch settlers, as you know. And the reason I give you background on that is, when you understand their philosophy and the way they looked at things, Everything that happened to them historically is going to make more sense to you. And the things that they did while they were here are going to make more sense to you. So here's, I'm going to use this little guy. So here is New Jersey. And our Lenai Lenape were called the Delaware, which is translated to the first men. But the way that they looked at their tribes, within the Delaware, their areas would kind of to know what name they were going to use. So the, our North Jersey friends were the Muncie. Our Monmouth County friends were the Unami. And I think we had the greatest name. Our visitors were called the Unilachtico, which is just, it just rolls off the tongue. And I'm gonna get into that in a little bit, the language and the ling linguistics. Before I get to that though, I have a little video. Um, in order to, understand our visitors, we have to understand the people who were up north, these people, these travelers who walked down to see us. And here's a little video. They were one big tribe, Lenape, which means the people, the original people. Why did the people sell Manhattan Island for trinkets? Well, it's a long story about these Indians that had sold Manhattan Island for $24 worth of beads. A lot of Indian land was taken without permission. New York's a good example of it. They got overrun and sold out. And they're gone. these different migrations of people that left. There are some that said, you know, I don't want to go anywhere and went and hid. Many of the groups disappeared, there were vestiges, small units of the groups maintained. We kind of lost 
lost all of our history because we had to assimilate into the mountains and stay away from everybody else. We sit 30 miles from New York City. And even with that said, why should it be so surprising that there's still Native American tribe here that's still intact? We're part of the Lenape Indians, and this is where we've been for the last millennia. $24 for Manhattan Island. <laughs> Anyone try to be, uh, buy real estate in New York or Manhattan now? <laughs> Roll up to $24. Um, growing up and learning about that sale, that historic sale of Manhattan Island, it's, it was kind of told to us in the textbooks as, oh, those silly Indians kind of thing. And I think that's probably one of the most unfair assessments of a people I've ever seen. Um, Yes, the Lenai Lenape sold um, Manhattan Island for trinkets, but when you get into their culture, uh, the sale of land didn't even register in their way of thinking. The Lenai Lenape were nature-loving people. They were polytheistic. They were people who believed that the land itself was a god. The land itself was run by spirits. So in their philosophy, you couldn't own land. So how could you sell something that you didn't own? If I turned to you and I said, I'll give you $24 for your invisible unicorn. Would you take that $24? You would, right? And I'd be like, rrr, 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 I have that unicorn. Uh, that, uh, that metaphor or the comparison is basically the way that they viewed that land sale. This, you can't own land. The um, creation story that the Lenape believe in is that the land gave us life, if that makes sense. The land itself was this turtle, okay? This so beautiful visual. There's this land turtle. And from the turtle, through the mountains, through the earth, through the trees, and all the spirits on it that dictate the way our lives go come from the earth. So in their core, intrinsically, the Lenai Lenape, to ask them to sell land was the most offensive thing that you could ask them. So they kind of like laughed it off. Uh, they did not even believe that you could own it. Their spiritual men, their leaders, when they were faced with that kind of deal, didn't think anything of it. So this historical depiction of the Native Americans as being you know, not as wise as, as the, the English and the um, Dutch, not so true. And as the video said, there were, there were a lot of Lenape who didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave their lands. They found places to settle. Luckily, South Jersey was one of those places. We were one of the places where the Lenai Lenape, much like, like myself, um, I'm a North Jersey person who would come here on vacation, and I really, really liked it here. And when it was time to leave the New York area, uh, my husband said, where do you want to go? And I said, uh, Cape May. Anywhere around Cape May would be perfect. And basically, that's what the Lenai Lenape did. The Lenai Lenape who came and settled here had seen this area. They knew they liked it. They knew the land was plentiful. And when it was time to leave north, they came south. But imagine taking that walk. Imagine taking that walk from exit 153, 163 here, doing the whole thing on foot. That's what they did while carrying all of their belongings and their children. That's something to keep in mind. From that turtle, by the way, that beautiful turtle with the land and the mountains, on that turtle, it sounds like a children's book, on that turtle there grew land, and from that land there grew a tree, and from that tree there grew a sprout, and from that sprout there grew man. That's really the creation story. They really thought that we came from that land, um, and then that tree came and kissed the sprout of man. So the, sorry, you're going to be my, my model here. The branch came and kissed man. And from that kiss came woman. So you want to talk about people who were connected with the land, that's the Lenai Lenape. They, they had reverence for it. I want to show you an example as I, so I'm going to use this again. Um, imagine walking from Bergen County, from Sussex County, with this little guy on your back. So I'm going to get into children and, and wearing children in a second. But before that, I want to also talk to you about their, their origin of war. So from this beautiful story on the land, there was also the myth that there was a magical bear tooth. And anyone who owned this bear tooth would get all the power in the world. And the Lenai Lenape understood, you know, as primitive as they're depicted in being, philosophically they knew that with power came division. 
So in their myth, uh, the tribe within itself started fighting for the ownership of this tooth because the power hungry wanted that tooth, and that's how they um, that's how they explain the division of all the tribes, the division of all the first people, why people ended up out west, while people why people ended up up north. So philosophically, I think they really understood the way that man works. They just didn't look at things the same way that the English and the Dutch did. So how did they solve the big war of the bear tooth? The spirit, the great spirit saw what was happening, was very upset, and went to the tallest mountain and lit a fire. And that fire attracted all the first people to the mountain. And on that mountain, he took a branch with a soapstone bowl, and he made the first peace pipe. And the great spirit, this is the mythology, tells us that amongst themselves, the Lenape learned that every problem can be talked about in a peaceful manner. That you sit with your peace pipe and you can diplomatically talk things out. That doesn't sound very primitive to me. It sounds kind of elevated thinking, uh, but that's all part of their mythology. The women and the structure of their society was matrilocal. So women in the Lenape tribe held lots of sway over what the men said. I know we have the depictions of the, of the sachem being the absolute boss, boss, boss of everyone, which is true. The sachem or the, or the head chief did make the ultimate decisions. However, when there were land disputes among the Lenape people, the women were the people who were consulted on what was going to happen with that land. And if you were a young man and you married a young woman, it was understood that you would move in with her family. So the women's family and the women were very powerful within the tribe. I also, I love when I do this presentation for young people, especially around November because we're kicking into Christmas season when I do this talk and I ask all my young people, how many of you asked for a corn husk doll for Christmas? <laughs> and they're, they're all looking like, I did it. Um, they made use of everything that they had, including corn husk, but the children did play. Uh, it was a very different society than we're used to. Women were carrying their babies. As long as that kid couldn't sit up, they were being carried, uh, almost like an accessory. So everything the woman was doing, if it was cooking, if it was planting, if it was working the land, she was wearing her child. As soon as that baby was old enough to sit up, that baby would be put in the care of an older sibling. And when I say older sibling, I mean like four or five years old. How many of you know like a four or five year old? Okay, you're four or five year old, here's this infant. Um, there are a lot of great responsibilities uh, within the tribes for both genders. The women were also healers. They were very, very knowledgeable in how to take the natural resources of the land and use them for natural medicine. And a lot of the cures that they used back then, we still use now. Uh, there are some that didn't work out, which I'm going to get into, but uh, the women were in charge of all of that. The men were the hunters, the fighters. Young men were taught to fight to the death. Unfortunately, as young as seven years old, was it because they were a violent tribe? No, but it was a necessary evil. Um, when, you, when you are traveling, you are apt to run into other tribes that do not like you. And when you fought, you, you fought to the death with um, weapons that were made of stone that could kill you. So they, they learned very early on how to defend themselves. Oh, the other thing I wanted to show you. See this? So this would be in a religious uh, ritual. This would be a mohawk. When they are traveling, the Lenai Lenape traveled by foot. Everything they did, they did by foot. They didn't ride horses. I know the Westerners love to tell us that all the native people were riding horses, but they're woodland Indians. What would happen if you tried to ride a horse through the woods? It would not work out. So they traveled by foot. They also didn't wear the big war bonnets that we see on television and in the movies and the Lone Ranger and all all those interesting depictions, again, because they were pragmatic. If you're walking through the woods and you have a giant headdress on it, you're not gonna get anywhere. So most of the time, the men are gonna have their hair pinned back, slick. Um, you're never gonna see it like this unless it's in a big re religious ritual or a fancy occasion. They were super pragmatic and they were super efficient. On efficiency, I told you about that sachem. So you have a wise man, a wise leader. When it comes to war, we don't talk to the wise man. We talk to the war chief. So when it's time to fight, there's a whole other chief called the war chief. And he's going to be a young, strapping fella 
who can actually practice what he preaches and put his money where his mouth is. He would get out there in the trenches and fight. He would be the equivalent of your general. Um, he'd also help and teach the young men with hunting. Hunting for meat was one of the primary sources of food, and in this area they were hunting red-tailed deer. And a red-tailed deer will yield you upwards of 100 pounds of meat. So they learned how to use that meat, how to use the skin. They used the sinew and the connective tissue to make weapons, to make musical instruments, to make thread to sew their, their clothes. They also learned how to make the earliest forms of beef jerky. They, they learned how to use salt to make that, that meat last during what they called, guess what they called winter? The starving time. Right. Very, very practical people. They don't want to starve in the winter, so they learn how to preserve their food. They also became artisans with the things that they did. Um, the clothing that they made, the beadwork that they did, is on display in museums all around the world. Uh, again, not this, this primitive depiction that we see on television. The average lifespan of a Native American, can anybody guess? 38. <laughs> 35, but you're really, really close. You're really, really close. Now, um, again, around that time period, the average uh, lifespan of basically everyone was close to 40, but 35, especially on average for a Native American, because once you start getting um, visitors from over the seas, they're bringing with them all the wonderful and beautiful bacteria that our, our Native Americans never had to deal with before. So a, a lot of the attrition um, was based on natural illness. Um, many children as well. Uh, had a high mortality rate, again, because of the weather, uh, the cold, and also uh, a lot of children died during their vision quest, which I'm going to get into. Children! Here's a good thing on children. Well, I love when I do this talk for young people because I tell them the Lenai Lenape did not believe in corporal punishment at all. And all the children say, yay, it sounds like heaven. They believe you do not raise your voice to a child. You do not yell at a child in anger. You do not raise a hand to a child, you do not hit them. And all the kids say, that sounds like paradise. I said, what they did believe in, and this is what we got to see when they came here especially, they believed in the power of cold water. Oh, I know. And, children, and the children said, wait, what now? And I said, yep, they believed that if a child was acting up, you could dip them in icy cold water and hold them there. And it would toughen the skin, and whereby toughen their character inside and cleanse their souls of what whatever was making them act up. So that doesn't seem very pleasant at all. Um, they also believed in pouring the water over their heads. Like there, there was there was levels of the punishment. So if you were a little bad, splash. If you were really bad, dunk. And we're going to cleanse you. Um, they also believed that. Young children, as young as seven, were old enough to take on household tasks to help with the cooking. Could you imagine handing a seven-year-old a sharp knife and saying, hey, cut that deer up for me? Um, lots of responsibility, very young. And vision quests would occur between 12 and 14, and the children would, young girls too. When people hear about vision quests, they assume that it was all boys, but young girls, if they chose to, um, would also go on their vision quest, and they would go off. You ever see the show Naked and Afraid? None of those survival shows, there's like a low naked. Okay, so it was like that. Only worse because they were children. They would send the, or the homesteaders, they would send them out into the forest and they would have to fend for themselves and starve themselves until they had their vision of what their spirit animal was. And it could be a hawk or a wolf or a bear. If you failed your vision quest, if you gave up, if you tapped out, it would be absolute dishonor for yourself, for your family, um, you'd go into hiding, it would be an awful thing. Uh, but they believed at that age, uh, between 12 and 14, you knew who you were. And guess what, when you came back from that vision quest, you were a man. You'd go fight in war. And if you're a woman and you came back from your vision quest, you'd get married and start your family. They also were in charge, at, as young as seven, as making the clay pots, cutting up meat, cooking, making clay pots, making those buckskin clothes, making jewelry, and they were good at it. Here's some examples. I want to get back to our areas. So I'm starting with my Central Jersey people. They were named for the turtle. 
So we have the Muncie, we have the Unilastico, um, and we have our, what did I say the turtles were? The what, baby? The Nancy? Yeah. So they're the turtles because they were plentiful with tur turtles. There were turtles everywhere, so they named themselves after the turtles. The Muncie named themselves after the wolves because in North Jersey, there are wolves. Makes sense, right? So Unilachtico, getting back to that wonderful name. What majestic, fierce, awesome animal did our South Jersey Lenai Lenape name themselves for? Turkey. The turtle, was it the hawk? Not a hawk. Turkey. Seagull, it is a bird. I, I, I love when people say seagull. The eagle would make Turkey. Yes! <laughs> Unilastico, the mighty turkey. <laughs> um, I love you, Seagull. In all fun, yes, turkeys are plentiful. All you have to do is drive inward, drive in west to my neck of the woods in Dennis Township, and these fellas are everywhere. And honest to goodness, you don't want to mess with the turkey. So it's funny because we think of them as delicious, but they're also fierce. So back then, it wasn't silly to be named for a turkey. On that, you know, let's go some language. Who wants to take a language lesson with me? We're going to learn some Algonquin. This is the official language of the Lenai Lenape, and if you go up to Monmouth County, you, go, you can still go to the Algonquin Theater. I use this again to prove, despite all the depictions of our Native people being super primitive, I got it in my head that I was going to learn Algonquin to do this talk. <coughs> like, how hard could it be? It's harder than Latin. It's harder than Anglo-Saxon, and it's harder than Russian. There are so many rules and dialects within Algonquin. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do a tutorial. So if you would um, oblige, let's do a little lesson. Lenape language lessons, lesson one. New number word. Quente, one. Quente. Quente. New color word. Sique, it is black. Sique. Siksu, he or she is black. Siksu. New living word. Ahas, crow. Ahas. Ahas suck. Crows, ahas suck. New non-living word. Hembus, shirt. Hembus. Hemsa, shirts. Hemsa. Conversation. Hey. It's an easy one. Hello. Hey. Hey. Kula Malsi Hutch. How are you? Kula Malsi Hutch. Nula Malsi, I am fine. Nula Malsi. So there are rules for gender, for plural, for singular. Did you catch any of the other rules? Living, non-living, there's so many rules you could get lost in Algonquin. And how are our native people depicted in movies? How do they talk? How? how? <laughs> right? So I feel like there's been a disparity in the way that the linguistics were represented. The houses. So all of us in the winter, right here, this would be a longhouse. You guys want to be my roommates? Because that's how it would be. In a long house, you would have up to 40 people sharing space, sharing food for the, the duration of the winter. Could you imagine that? Would you have to be a peaceful and, and <laughs> understanding kind of society? Absolutely. In the summer when it was warmer, they would downsize because as we know, no one wants to be in a big hot room with a bunch of people, so they would downsize to, to wigwams. Or they would travel, and they would take everything they had on their back, and they
they would come down to South Jersey because we're the best. They would use birch bark canoes that they made with their hands, and I'm going to show you some pictures of the kinds of boats that they traveled in and that they went whaling in, and you're going to go, oh, no way, um, but I'm going to get there in a second. I'm going to show you um, their spiritual leader, leaders, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of their superstitions as well. Are any of you here superstitious? You've got nothing on the Lenai Lenape, trust me. Um, some of their superstitions included no pointing. If you pointed at someone, you were, you were basically picking a fight with their soul. <laughs> Which is, you know, that's a little deep. Um, <laughs> sometimes you just point at somebody like, hey, how's it going? Um, they believed a pregnant woman should not eat chicken. <laughs> Don't eat chicken. Um, now again, there are things that are going to sound silly and superstitious, but I can see where the foundation was. If you were cooking by the fire and you ate chicken, and you even were pregnant, what could possibly happen to you? You're going to get diseases. So I'm going to guess that was the root of the superstition. And it would, you know, show itself in stomach pain. Oh, I've got salmonella. They didn't know that. So they said a woman should not eat chicken because that stomach pain they equated with the chicken reconstituting itself in the woman's stomach and trying to scratch its little chicken way out of her stomach. That's how they explain that, which I think is really interesting. For the life of me, I have no idea why they thought looking at a possum would make you have an ugly baby. <laughs> but they thought that. They thought if a pregnant woman looked at a possum, your kid's going to be ugly. And honestly, I think the possums are kind of cute, and I think that's unfair. How many of you have seen the She Shed commercial? The She Shed, Sheila, guess what? The Lenai Lenape had the She Shed first. If a woman was not feeling well, you know every once in a while a woman doesn't feel well? She was asked to leave the tribe and go to her own little She Shed and wait out her time that she wasn't feeling well. And when she was done, she could come back and rejoin the tribe. I would be, I'd be fake and sick. I'd be like, I'm on my own house. I don't want to be in the long house with all those people. They also believed in a sweat lodge. They thought if you weren't feeling well, you could go and sit in a small cramped area and they would build a fire inside it and you could sweat out whatever was making you ill. Um, sounds gross, but people still do that. People do hot yoga and saunas are still very popular and they were doing it before anyone else. This one's silly. Don't look at a rabbit when you're pregnant. You will get a hair lip. Oh That's God. not even a joke. I wish I was making like a really bad pun. I said, what the heck? They honestly thought um, that you would, that's where that, that came from, um, that you would have that deformity. Um, they didn't let pregnant women eat liver, which was kind of a good choice, I feel like. Uh, but this is one that proved to be true. Liver is high in vitamin A or retinol, which is notoriously horrible for pregnancies. So again, they probably noticed that the women who were eating liver over and over again while they were pregnant were either losing their children or having very difficult pregnancies. So they said, that's it. We'll make a superstition. Liver's really bad for you. So thank them for that. They ate more things than liver. Um, they ate beans. They ate corn. They ate squash, and one of the things that they did, especially for the, the newcomers, the English and the Dutch, they taught them how to prepare beans and corn, that you have to boil them, and you have to cook them for a certain amount of time to make them edible, so we thank them for that. But they, when they came here, they had even better things. Think of the things that we eat now in the summertime here. All the wonderful things that we have, they had. Clams, lobster, flounder. All the things that we could get from the sea, they were cultivating and gathering and cooking well before we were. Nuts, berries, all of these things, they came down here in the summer, they would load them up, and when they went back home to where they were, they would store them during the starving time. I would want to visit here as well. Here's an example of the smaller house for when it's hot, and here's an example of the long boat. It actually doesn't look that long. But look at the engineering. They knew to tar and sap the center of the boat for when it was cold, to build a fire in the center of the boat as they traveled. If I was in charge of this boat, we would all be in trouble. Uh, but they were, they were doing and crafting boats and making feats of engineering that we couldn't imagine. Meanwhile, they're depicted as being you know, primitive. Also imagine taking 
this skinny little boat. If any of you have ever gone up to the museum, um, the Cape May Museum on Route 9 by the zoo, mm -hmm. we actually have a long boat that they found um, in Belle Plaine. It's about this narrow. You'll never feel like your hips are bigger than if you have, if you look at this. It's about this. I don't think I'd fit, to be honest. I think I would have to squat. It's this skinny, skinny, almost like a skateboard, the, the width of it. Two men would board this boat with a spear in their hands, and they would go and fish for a whale. How many of you would want to go hunt a whale on this thing? Not only did they do it, but they did it well. They're the reason why our settlers were so successful down here. They're the reason why the fishing industry down here became the fishing industry. So we should probably thank them for that. Here's more examples of their food. I'm a little food centric, I apologize, but they feasted. They came down here and the food was quadruple what they would have up north. And historically and by oral history, our Lene Lenape were, were well fed and they lived longer. Maybe they're the ones who hit 38. Um, <laughs> But it's also the reason why when everything started kind of going sideways up north, they knew when they had to go somewhere. If you had to choose between, this is no offense to Ohio, but if you had to choose between Ohio and here, you're going to come here. Here's some of that beautiful shellfish and their beautiful dried fruits. They engineered the fishing wire. Now, I think I talked about how they were practical and efficient. The Lenai Lenape realized they could stand for three hours with one stick with a piece of sinew and maybe catch a fish. Or they could weave together an intricate network of sticks with a large opening in the front and a small, small enclosure in the end that fish can swim into, get really confused because they're fish, and not be able to get out. And in that same amount of time, instead of catching, instead of catching a fish, they catch 300 fish. They figured that out. Guess who they taught how to do that? All those really nice settlers who came in. And I know historically the settlers uh, did not treat them so well, but they did teach our settlers down here that trick. Here are some of the weapons that they made. I don't know about you folks, but I would not want to get into a fight with that. They fought with stone weapons. Um, terrible, horrible. They used everything. They used absolutely everything and they wasted nothing. This was a musical instrument. Can anyone recognize what food item or? Turtle. It's a turtle. It's one of those unami. They made a musical instrument out of it. Um, it's a rattle. It's filled with stones. Another thing that our settlers down here realized, and our visitors, was down in my neck of the woods in Cape May. If you go all the way down to Cape May Point, you know where the sunken ship is? Mm -hmm. If you go there early in the morning, even today, what can you find? Diamonds! Quartz. The Cape yeah. May diamonds, they're actually quartz. Yeah. They're quite beautiful. Um, they came down here and they realized that it was a treasure trove. Now going back to Manhattan and the quote unquote trinkets that the Lenai Lenape sold Manhattan for, Lenai Lenape believed that things like Cape May diamonds were direct gifts from God, from the spirits. When they saw something beautiful in nature, that to them registered as valuable. So when they came to Cape May and they saw these Cape May diamonds, they thought, this is a beautiful and revered place. This is a magical place. This is a spiritual place. It's the same logic that led to people accepting $24 in trinkets for Manhattan. So you get that kind of logical connection. This is what a Cape May diamond looks like. They're quite nice. They're actually quartz. And, uh, this, between the soil and the sea, they get washed almost like as if they're in a, a rock tumbler. And to Lenai Lenape, these were the greatest things that you could give someone in this area. So our Unilachtico, if you handed someone a Cape May diamond, you loved them very much or you valued what they did for you very much. I do not work for the Cape May diamond company. <laughs> Just disclaimer. So here we are. Here is a beautiful hunk of Tuckahoe. What is it? This is a hunk of Tuckahoe. It's a Tuckahoe root. You ever been to Tuckahoe? It's a real thing. So our visitors to this area are permanent residents, the ones who came here on vacation and said, you know what? This is a mighty fine place to stay. Let's settle down. So in northern Cape May, we have the Tuckahoe. And they named themselves the Tuckahoe because the Tuckahoe root um, grew, grew there. Um, 
abundantly and it was very easy to grow. And Tuckahoe root is a sweet potato that is not sweet. That's the best way that I can describe it. It's a, a root vegetable that's not as wonderful and unctuous as a potato, uh, but the texture of a sweet potato without being sweet, if that makes sense. And they would use this and they would grind it into flour. They would roast it and eat it like meat. They would pound it into uh, flat bread that would kind of look like a tortilla. It was good eating and they named themselves the Tuckahoe for that reason. Then there were the Ketchumetchi, who were our Cape May um, visitors. Ketchumetchi is not a food. It's an Algonquin word, um, but I don't even know, I don't even know what it, it translates to. Ketchumetchi just means Ketchumetchi, which is kind of sad. What I love about this is wherever they traveled, and this, this goes for the entire state, for the entire East Coast, and even out West, the trails that our Native American friends took they took the fast and high dry land. They walked these trails on foot for years and years and years and years. Those trails, when the English and the Dutch came, became our road system. So when you drive down Indian Trail Road, that's why it's called Indian Trail Road. That blew my mind. Route 9 was one of the most highly used trails from our Native American friends. They were the reason why Route 9 is Route 9. Route 9 that starts down in Cape May goes all the way up to Jersey City where I came from, that blew my mind. And to imagine doing that on foot, carrying everything that you own, and having the energy to fight with people if they picked a fight with you while you were doing it. So, unfortunately, like everyone else, the Lenai Lenape have a mortality rate. They died mostly by, by 35, and when they did, they had these burial mounds. In those burial mounds, they would place arrowheads, shell piles. They would also take a bowl of food and put a bowl of food next to the body just in case they got hungry in the afterlife. So what's interesting is when we find these artifacts in Cape May County, we find the bones, but we also find the pots. And we also find little petrified pieces of, of stones and jewels and, and the remnants of whatever they were buried with. Uh, so again, if you're at the Cape May Museum, they have a lot of those. Their villages were in Fishing Creek, West Cape May, Tuckahoe, Rio Grande. So actually right around Starbucks was one of the biggest gathering places, which I think is hilarious because if we go to Starbucks right now, it's still a gathering place. Um, Beasley's Point, Higby Beach if you've ever gone. One of our uh, classic ghost stories in Cape May County uh, happened on Higby Beach. So Craig McManus, who is our big ghost expert, uh, swears, swears up and down that he saw the spirits of two graves on Higby Beach. If I could raise one eyebrow, I would. I'm a little cynical about ghost stories, but you know what we did find on Higby Beach? Lots and lots of arrowheads and proof that our Native Americans did visit Higby Beach. I never met the ghosts, but I do believe that they were there. I want to give you a timeline on the mortality rate and the attrition. When the Europeans came in, in the 1630s and the 1660s. The English came in in the 1670s. The, Ameri the Americans who were settling from other areas in America in the 1770s and 1800. Out of all of these people, the Dutch treated our native uh, visitor, or our native, um, native natives, the worst out of everyone. The Dutch were absolutely abysmal. Now, I've read, I've read accounts of what the, the British did to think that the Dutch were worse than the British. I kind of like, want to put on pearls so I can clutch them, but the Dutch were absolutely terrible. They thought that the native people were less than human, and they treated them as such. It's important to know that that, that was happening up north, because I promise there's like a happy side to it coming up. Before the Europeans, there were 4,000. By 1735, 500, and by 1800 in this area, mostly gone. Attrition is caused by migration disease. Alcoholism is the thing that I, I like to point out, because this is the part that I think is diabolical. Settlers who wanted to take over certain areas realized that our native friends had no idea what alcohol was. And they realized very quickly that if they gave our native friends alcohol, they would become very sick or they would become dependent, so dependent that they became pliable and compliant. So it was like, if we get them drunk enough, we can take whatever we want. So a lot of the alcoholism, um, which was a, a predetermined genetic condition, I think the, the, bi the biology of it is genetically, they couldn't handle the alcohol in the same way that the settlers could, 
they capitalized on that in a big way. However, meanwhile in Cape May, things were a little bit different. So down in Cape May, we have all this fishing industry, we have whaling, and we have King Nummy, who realizes as a wise sachem, I can work with these fellas, and I can capitalize, and I can teach them how to fish, and I can make this a peaceful accord. Now, while all this is happening, while the 10 Ketchumetchis and Tuckahoe signed the first land grant, and all of this is happening, um, terrible things are happening in other areas. So there are the Nanticoke, Delaware, who are just across the bay in Delaware. As we're kind of learning to fish together and whale together, the Nanticoke massacred settlers. They were violent. And it, I just think one body of water made a big difference because our, our Ketchumetchi were much more peaceful with the, the white man who came in. They taught them this. These are the more uh, civilized and stronger whaling boats. Anyone want to go whaling? I still don't want to go whaling. It doesn't seem like it would be a fun thing. But the earliest whalers are in the 1670s in Town Bank. At the same time that all these terrible things are happening in other parts of the state, we are whaling together. So it wasn't, it wasn't all silver lining, but it was a little nicer down here. King Nummy, as, as I was talking about, he entered history's uh, account in 1685 when he brokered this land deal. And he ended up changing his name to Tommy Nummy. Like, he ended up assimilating. He ended up, he was very different, you know, than, than a lot of when I went up, eh? He was very wise. So while many Lenny Lenape left, there was a handful, especially down here, who stuck around because it was profitable. And again, who wouldn't want to stay here? The burial mounds, some Indians died before the big grand exodus and they were buried here. And where they are is up for conjecture, especially King Nummy. Some people think that King Nummy is buried on a small island by the Hereford, um, by the lighthouse. They think there's this little island, and if you travel out to it, you're going to find a mound, and there lies King Nummy. I'm not sure if that's true. But it would be right around there. Others contend that he's somewhere outside Meg's restaurant. And that, to me, is hilarious. Now, here's, here's the kicker. There are things that I said, I'm like, come on. However, I'm giving this talk in Dennis Township, and this little hand goes up, and this little cherub says, my nan and grandpa own Menz's restaurant, and they find arrowheads all the time in the parking lot. And I'm like, kid, I'm so sorry. We didn't mean to make a joke. Um, but to this day, I mean, it's 20, 2020, and they're still finding arrowheads uh, in that parking lot. So to think, you know, you go to Menz, you get a you go to a Halloween dinner, and you could be on a se on sacred ground. Speaking of sacred ground and something not so sacred, one of the largest Indian burial sites is outside Cold Spring Cemetery. There were 300 burial mounds. The stones, the pots, the clay pots, all of this wonderful stuff. Guess what happened? What? <laughs> Local fishermen took the burial mounds and used the stones for ballast on their ships and their boats. Is that horrible? I mean, as a Stephen King fan, I'm like, you can't do that. You cannot do that, but they did do it. So there are, there are definitely um, remnants that were salvaged. However, hundreds and hundreds of burial mounds were desecrated and just taken away as if they never existed. And with those burial mounds goes a lot of the history that we could be learning from to, to find you know, even more connection and relevancy to what happened here. They were given legal status as persons in 1791. I, I don't even understand how I could say that out loud. The Lenai Lenape, those Nanakoks that I was talking about, the ones who massacred the settlers in Delaware, they linked up with our Delaware, with our Lenai Lenape in the 1800s. They had calmed down a little bit by then. The Lenai Lenape were made citizens in 1924. So they've been here 10,000 years. They were made citizens in 1924. Most moved out, but like I said, in this area we had a bunch of hanger honors, which I think is wonderful, recognized as a religion in 1978. That's not that long ago. 
If you want to see the migration that they took, the path that the people who decided to leave for good, imagine doing this. This, this route is the craziest on foot. Anyone want to walk to Oklahoma? I definitely don't want to walk to Oklahoma. I think I would definitely be among the Delaware who stayed in this area and took advantage of the clams and the whaling. Princess Snowflower I love to talk about because she is King Nummy's sister and she is known lovingly as Kate May's Pocahontas. So she helped people learn the lay of the land, those, those high and fast paths that I was talking about. Um, she taught the people who came in how to use those, also how to work the land. I want to show you this. Where are the Lenai Lenape today? We don't, if I look around this room, no offense, I don't see any Lenai Lenape. So what happened to them? They're still here, I promise. If you go up to the mall the back way through Maze Landing, there's a, there's a Lenai Lenape like memorial at the park. There's also a Lenai Lenape meetup that happens here where Lenai Lenape meet in the Delaware Bay and they get in long boats and they take a traditional uh, voyage. So you can see that, I think that happens in the summer. This is in North Jersey. Drums representing Mother Earth and the heartbeat of the nation set rhythms for hours of dancing at the annual Nanticook Lenny Lenape powwow. Our dance is one of the most sacred things the Native people have. It is our voice of creators, voice of the people. I've had people walk up to me after I dance. It was in tears. Brooks and fiance Emily Jeffries are the head dancers at this year's powwow. They're positions of tremendous honor. None of the dancers will enter the circle until we've entered the circle first. Uh, we're also part of the honor guard at the beginning of the powwow. Powwows are living events, not reenactments. At the core, they're spiritual celebrations. For me, every step is a prayer because we don't dance for ourselves, we dance for others, we dance for the ones that don't dance anymore, we dance for our children, we dance for our soldiers. And while there are basic steps learned in childhood, nothing is choreographed. You can't choreograph at prayer. So when you truly pray to, pray to Creator, your dance steps represent you. You're actually speaking in your own language to Him. Because it's a ceremony of religious importance and there's a long history of cultural misrepresentation, the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape Tribal Nation provides background information on their website and introduces prayers, dances, and traditions to attendees. And we see again this beautiful beaver that represents something about them as a person or perhaps the heir of the country. Etiquette basics are posted so non-native members of the public feel informed and welcome. Educating school children and the public is a big focus of the event. We weren't allowed to be native. In 1924 is when we got our citizenships. 1978 is when we were allowed to practice our religion. So when we used to have our ceremonies, we used to have a guard out at the end of the driveway to the street. So I did this talk, and I had you know kind of a cynic say, "Did they really need a guard? Was someone going to come arrest them?" And I said, "I don't. I don't think." you know, pre-1978, from the 60s to 1970, they were going to get arrested. However, they put that guard out there to remind people, we're not allowed to do this. We're legally not allowed to do this, and we're going to put these guards up to let everyone know. So they weren't recognized until 1978, having been here for 10,000 years, and really helping out this area tremendously. Um, so just a little food for thought on our visitors, on our, on our first tourists the Lenai Lenape, our first transplants. I, I think I owe them a debt of gratitude. I have one last Algonquin word to teach you, though, if you will if you will be so kind as to do another word with me. Just one more. And that word is Wanishi. Wanishi. And Wanishi means thank you. So thank you. Thank you for coming. They do, they do. There's um, if you look, there's a network where you can find events, um, religious memorials, and, and trips that they take. Um, and I apologize, the, the last time I did this talk, it was a lunch and learn, and I actually made a Lenai Lenape treat. I used a mortar and a pestle and everything. I got a little too into it. I, just, <laughs> I couldn't do it today. I was too busy trying to learn Algonquin. Can I make a comment? Yes. 
I worked in Morristown at the Aegis test site where they were building a ship. And it, the test site is in a big field, okay? It was formerly a farm field. But next to that field was supposedly another field that they wouldn't touch because supposedly there was a limit, limit the burial mound on that field. Right. This is in Burlington County in Morristown. Do you know someone who goes to the, um, the luncheons at the Blind Center at the Methodist? I heard some, some, you might know the same person because I mm -hmm. gave that talk there and they told me the same mm -hmm. thing. And I think it's really interesting historically, you find people who find these burial sites and they're like, nobody can touch this area. We're not, and then there's other people who kind of just barrel through. And they're like, oh, we'll figure it out when we're done. Um, luckily, Kate May, this whole area, we seem to be have a profound interest in our history. So anytime anyone finds anything, they usually are pretty good about calling the Kate May Museum and bringing um, any kind of arrowheads bones, pieces of clay pots. Uh, so again, I don't work for them either, but if you want to see, I mean, it's a it's a rather impressive collection that we've got. But they today. never built anything in that field. I All around that. that field was the Aegis test site, but there was also residential developments. And then they just kept that. They, but, you know, for whatever reason, I never really looked into it, but right. that was the story, that yeah. there was a burial ground there, Lena, will not be burial ground. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look into that. I'll go, I'm going to go poke around. It's in Morristown, New Jersey. Okay. M-O-O-R-E-S. I love poking into stuff like that. Well, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. What's the day? Thank you. Spike drums. Oh, okay. So, well, but I know that there were, in the first, in the peace pipe in the mythology, it was sumac. And then they moved on to tobacco. However, I know a lot about natural medicine. It's a whole nother talk. But our Native Americans did know how to cultivate the land. And I thought it was really interesting that their shirt was called hempus and that we call that material hemp. There was that short answer, sometimes. But we would consider drugs. Um, use of anything that grows from you know, there are certain mushrooms that I'm sure if we ate, we, my husband would come and pay us a visit and tell us we're not allowed to do that, but our Native American friends would put it in their tea and use it as natural medicine. Is it true that the, um, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is it true that the purple inside the clam shells is quahog? That was their wampum, that's their money? They, that was one of them. That was okay. one of the, there were, there were several things that could be used as money. The, the shells, um, pearls, if you could find a pearl, that would be great. The Kate May diamonds, and the money or the things that were prioritized as valuable were really dictated by the area and the people in the area. Mm -hmm. So someone down here, a Ketchumetchee, if you give them the Kate May diamond, it would be a big deal. If you went up to New England and you give them the Kate May diamond, they'd tell it's nice, but it's not Quahog. Mm -hmm. Now, the ones that moved out to Oklahoma, do they live on reservations? Some do and some don't. Okay. Many, and that's one of the reasons, too, that a lot of the history disappears. Because from my, uh, my oral historians, um, I have someone who I talked to in Avalon who didn't even know she was Native American until she was an adult. She was always told she was French. And her grandmother said, we couldn't tell you because we were trying to protect you because we didn't want to move to a reservation. So that, that's one reason why a lot of the, the history and the ancestry disappears. People assimilated out of necessity but, and out of fear. Uh, and then other people who moved to the reservations adapted to that lifestyle and kind of separated from everyone else and said, well, we're not giving you our history, you don't deserve it. So there's a lot of disparities and things that happen and there's a lot of missing blocks of time in history because people weren't allowed to talk about it. I know, it's sad. Anybody else? I got one more question. You got it. <laughs> the vision quests when they were younger, was that, did that have anything to do with uh, illegal drugs too? Or are you not sure? Um, our one Lenape had more to do with hallucinations based on starvation. Okay. But out west, out west especially, there would be certain cactus that were used to induce hallucination. So our folks, starvation, out west, more likely or not peyote. Gotcha. Thanks. No problem. Oh, stay tuned too. Um, I just got approved at the library as well to do. I'm doing a creative writing course in the summer. So if anyone wants to write, we can write about Native Americans. I have no problem. Um, 
but we're going to do some poetry in the summer as well. And I'm also doing, I'm working on two more talks on Native Americans, and it's Native American influence on American culture, and the second is Native American folklore. Because if you love mythology, Native American folklore has got Greek mythology beat. So, thank you. Everyone, uh, the uh, first hour program for next month, I think it's good, it's, it's Liberty. It's the uh, story of the Statue of Liberty. We have the gentleman who is an author and uh, lecturer, Kevin Boyce, who's coming down from way up almost uh, from New York, coming down to talk about the Statue of Liberty. It, uh, it was commissioned in 1886, so uh, I think it's going to be real interesting. Uh, March 7th, first Saturday of the month. At 1 o'clock, same time. I cannot thank you, as Melissa said, for all your coming out today. This is great. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great day.